Hey, welcome everyone to Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. I'm your host, Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, the top five fears in retirement. Part two in our series on how to make your retirement golden with nationally recognized retirement expert, author, and adjunct professor of the American College, Curtis Cloak. Welcome to the second segment, Curtis. Thank you, Steve. Curtis, we're talking about some pretty tough here, issues here. We're talking about the five fears. Now, these fears are not false evidences appearing real. <laughs> these are warranted. Walk me through the five, and then we'll talk each one. All right. So th the question is uh, for consumers as they're approaching retirement, or should I say pre-retirees and even post-retirees, what keeps them up at night? And having done this for 30 years, we've identified this top five list of fears. Doesn't mean it's the only fears that people have, but let's just talk about mm -hmm. what I found them to be. The first one is outliving their money. May I just use a different term and say, do I have enough? Do, am I going to run out? That's really what mm -hmm. outliving their money, their fear of outrunning their money is. The, the two is control, three is inflation, four is legacy, and two pronged investment mistake. And that one is as important as the first. So those are the five bullets of fears that we find mm -hmm. people have, and uh, and those those are predominantly what we hear when when people come in. All right, well let's talk about outliving your. Now listen, old Susanna Jones just died in 2016. She died at 116. She was a tri centurion born in 1899, and she was a super centenarian teenager at 116. Now, people say, well that's an outlier. Curtis, where's uh. the where's the longevity movement going? Yeah, so if you take a look at the centurions in the United States, they've, they've increased over the last 10 years tenfold. And with longevity and improvements in medical technology, we'll continue to see centurions be a routine mm. and not an outlier. Now, we don't know how far this goes, how quickly, and I know that we'll have some setbacks uh, somewhere along the way mm. where we saw this year for the first time a incremental backup in longevity reporting. And mm -hmm. so I don't think it's a straight line up, but I think that as we continue to improve technology and medicine, just think of just think of polio. People died of it today, it's non-existent, just by a single mm. drug that was supported by the March of Dimes. Uh, just think of, uh, of, of, of things that caused the heart to create a heart attack for which people would die in their 40s. Now a single pill saves their life and they're living till they're 90. So medical technology mm. that w was creating invasive surgeries and procedures today are solved by really taking a pill. That's medical technology. Those things uh, will continue. A lot of research is being done to eradicate some of the illnesses and the diseases of the country, and we're going to continue to see that happen. Okay, so we're going to live longer, and you need to put that in your equation for retirement. People have this issue, and I just I have to say, Steve Savant might have it himself. You want control of your money. Mm. I have to hoard it. I have to be able to touch it. I may have to put my arms on it. But Curtis, sometimes it's actually self-defeating. Talk a little bit about this fear of controlling our money. Yeah, so I want to talk about control in the, in the vein of the, the illusion of control. Ah. And we have this illusion of control when, when in reality we may be not having as the control that we want. What's the control that consumers want generally about their money after the retirement plan is built? Well, I perceive that what consumers want is not only some assurance that the portfolio and the planning and the withdrawal rates and all the things that they need to be tested and back tested based on their goals, their wants and their resources is an income flow they fear and hope won't run out. But they also like a, 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 a pile of dry powder, if I can use the term. In other words, if they want to take their grandkids to Disney World, they want to know that there's a block of capital they can take from the portfolio mm -hmm. without causing harm to the longevity of their income mm -hmm. flow. And so let's pretend for a minute that I have a husband and wife who've been successful accumulating a million dollars in the retirement plans, and they have another $30,000 for emergency fund and cash flow management of their sp of spending habits and, and, and their lifestyle in their checking account. And, and what we're going to find, we don't detail it too much in this show, is that safe withdrawal rates based on all the academic studies today is generally 3% of the mm -hmm. asset. Well, if that's true, and, and I've got this, this, this client with a million dollars husband and wife have accumulated over time, if 3% is the safe withdrawal rate, they're stuck with $30,000 out of every million they've accumulated. Well, remember, if all they got is a million and they'd like to know if they can take their grandkids to Disney World, do I have excess dollars to go? 
If I position my dollars where I'm held hostage to a 3% or 30,000 per million cash flow, and I want additional dry powder to go to Disney World for 10 or $20,000, well, if I take that 10 or $20,000 out of my million and I'm stuck with 3%, I'm gonna reduce my lifestyle for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. I'm gonna cannibalize part of the portfolio. So I really have no discretionary liquidity, which is what they want. That's the control they want. And it's because we're constraining portfolios to the way the bridge was done mm -hmm. that's been rendered useless. And there are new ways to take longevity risk off the table to get higher withdrawal rates and have it safe so that I don't have to hold as much of my capital hostage so I can create that dry powder. And that's the illusion of control. Well, inflation. Now, I keep telling, I keep telling here by the government through radio television that we're really in a low inflation. But I don't know about you, but every time I see the inflation numbers, I still got gasoline to use, food to use. All this stuff is not incorporated into the inflation rate. What's with that? Well, the problem is that the government only has so many dollars, and they're also trying to manage entitlements with keeping taxes low for everybody involved. And the problem is, because of longevity and a host of other things, they can't afford uh, the inflation uh, uh, numbers as they were originally created. So over time, we've had the CPI, we've had the CPIU, we've had the CPIW, mm. and what they keep doing is they keep changing what counts based on the federal government's tables to determine what the factors are to increase Social Security and federal pensions. Well, what they've taken out in the last round is they took out food. And they took out utilities, they took out gasoline, they took out health care. Well, the very things we're finding the greatest inflation factor that impacts our life are the very things that aren't counted and what the government counts for the inflationary factor that drives up increases to Social Security and federal pensions. And so we had this illusion as general population that says, well, the federal government says we're in low in inflation, when in fact, the inflation rate, when we add everything in as we used to, is really quite... Quite, pretty, pretty much double what the numbers are. So we must mm -hmm. contend with inflation when building retirement plans, and people are fearful of what is the right inflation mm -hmm. answer. Legacy. A lot of people are still constrained. I mean, they, they're holding maybe back in their lifestyle because they're trying to leave a legacy for their children, grandchildren, or maybe the charity of their choice. That's a fear. How can that be, or, or, uh, how can that be a fear? Well, I'm finding, I'm finding that this particular bullet is not necessarily a concern of 50% or more of the consumers mm -hmm. that are coming in, but it's still a top five. There's still enough worried mm -hmm. about it's a top five, but I wanna mm -hmm. point something out. Um, a, lot of, a lot of this generation of successful baby boomers, because of the generation of their parents who went through the depression, didn't really get much legacy from their family. Mm -hmm. And so they got the opinion, my kids will fend for themselves the way that I did. That's that's that 50% that says legacy is not that big a deal. But here's the piece of the legacy that I think matters, and it matters a lot. It's the legacy to the surviving spouse, whichever spouse that might be. Mm -hmm. And we got to remember that sometimes there are, if one's living long and one's living shorter, what are we doing not just to preserve uh, the income flow for us? And this mm -hmm. comes to the single life versus joint life on pensions. This comes to when do I turn on Social Security because I don't think I'm going to live very long. But if my spouse is benefited by how long I delay taking Social Security for mm -hmm. her livelihood in mm -hmm. the event I die, picking Social Security isn't about how long I'm going to live if mm -hmm. I'm the higher Social Security recipient. It's how long she's going to live. So legacy is not just about the kids or not just about the charity. It's a woman's issue predominantly in the U.S. and other societies. And it's making sure that that last surviving spouse is well cared for. That's a big legacy issue. Well, it's certainly a we decision, not a he decision. That's exactly right. Investment mistakes. Well, this is going to be a big one, uh, Curtis, and we, um, we're short on time. So tell me about this because everybody's reluctant. I already made a mistake. Well, people are worried about yeah. this one, and it's a biggie. It's yeah. as big as number one. It's two-pronged. The Madoffs of the world, who the heck do I trust? They just don't know who to trust, so they procrastinate decisions. And you know what happens then, Steve? They go home, they procrastinate picking somebody, and eventually they go, we've got to do something, and they go it alone. And so here's the thing I want to say. There are too many moving parts. There's too complicated for you to go home and try this alone. Find some advisor through some method that you believe that you can trust, and don't go home and try this alone because you'll be the one making the mistake. It won't be the advisor that you pick. But, but there are ways to figure out how to pick those advisors. 
Well, don't forget to watch our next segment, The Real Returns in Retirement, part three of our series on how to make your retirement golden. And keep in mind before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. Oh